Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, this is joint work with Abdel Abdelawi, uh, Wana Bork, and, and uh, David Duke Jones. Uh, let me start with two caveats. First of all, the title, it's not the title you have on the program, is my take on what exactly we're saying. Please don't mention this title to my co-author. I'm sure they, they would disagree. And in particular, there is an empirical part in the paper. I, I won't have time to talk about this. And actually, I want to concentrate on the on the theory part. Uh, but the, the empirical part has nothing to do with physical attractiveness. And unfortunately, we don't have data on this. But uh, second caveat, I know very little about genetics. And that, that will be obvious in a minute. I'm coming from economics. I'm coming from the matching literature. Uh, and so in particular, there will be some, gen what we call genetic in this model, as you will see, it will be extremely naive. So apologies for this, but let me try to, to tell you the, the kind of, in a nutshell, what kind of motivation we have for writing this. Uh, so uh, as, as James reminded us, the, the laws of genetic tell us, you start from a couple, which allele will be transmitted to the, to the children is the lottery. Uh, matching. Uh, is looking at the upstream problem, which is how those couples, where do they come from? You know, some couples exist and some couples do not exist. Uh, and who marries whom, who is in couple with whom, this is definitely not exogenous. This is endogenous. And actually all the matching literature is about this. How are, uh, what's, what are the kind of laws governing couples formation? Uh, so that's one of the thing we want to, uh, add this kind of matching perspective on problems which are related to genetics. And the second thing is, if you look at matching models, who marries whom, uh, some components are arguably genetic uh, or, or have a strong genetic component. Uh, some have a much less obvious genetic components. You know, if you win on the lottery, uh, the lottery uh, doesn't have much impact on your genes, but you will, it will have a, an impact on your attractiveness on the on the quote marriage market. So this is the kind of things we want to be toying around and we're gonna construct a very simple model to capture this. So uh, let me start from the matching perspective. So the question here is who marries whom, right? So think of a population of men and a population of women and each man and each woman is defined by several characteristics, uh, which means that there will be some kind of compensation you know, let's say all those characteristics contribute to your attractiveness. So if I'm less, if I have less of one characteristic, uh, may this might be compensated in terms of my own attractiveness by having more of some other characteristic, which is something, and there are some kind of papers trying to, uh, to look at this in, uh, in the data. Now, what's interesting is uh, to the extent that parental characteristics are transmitted to children, uh, this may create a correlation between the traits for the next generation. In other words, it might be that someone who is very endowed in one characteristic will be attractive because of the large endowment in this characteristic, might end up marrying someone who is very well endowed, but in the other characteristics, and that might create a correlation between the characteristics for the next generation. Uh, what the, what, where we're going here is really decided that maybe we should or could think of the, the genes are, as endogenous, uh, endogenous in terms of uh, outcomes of the matching process. So in particular, that I was taking the example of uh, you win at a lottery. Uh, this has no impact on your genes, but if it has an impact on the person you marry, it might have an impact on the genes of the next generation. So that's exactly the kind of question we want to explore uh, through a very simple model, as you will see. Now, we in this paper, we look at two traits. One, we call it genetic. Uh, it could be physical attractiveness. I like the example of physical attractiveness because it's not directly correlated with the other characteristic, which will be something like income, uh, but it, it could be innate ability. It could be, you know, whatever is as a, a strong genetic component. Uh, the second is social status. It could be human capital, it could be wealth, it could be income, it could be social prestige, and so on and so forth. Uh, I'm going to be very blunt here, and I'm going to assume that uh, they are completely different. So there is no direct in, uh, impact of genetic on social status. In the paper, we have a, a more extended model in which we take that into account, but I will concentrate on the simpler form. So the, the one thing you want to capture is if you have a shock, as I said, to a, an individual social status, 
it might be reflecting uh, in the genetic, not of this person, obviously, but in the genetics of the children, which mean that uh, genetic endowments might be partly endogenous through this process. Uh, what we are interested in, in particular, is the, the long-term dynamic of inequality. In particular, there is, a, there is something very intriguing, which is that inequality seems to be very persistent throughout time. Now, think of the simplest version in which there are lotteries. Your life is a series of lottery, and I may be lucky, and I win a lottery, and uh, I, I, I am wealthy because I, I had this, uh, the right ticket. Uh, so I have children. I will divide my, uh, my wealth between my children. In addition, there will be taxation. Uh, and it's clear that after three, four generations, uh, except for the top 0.1%, uh, my, my grand-grand-grandchildren will be back very close to, to the average of the population. On the other hand, if uh, the reason I'm wealthy is not the lottery, but it's because I'm smart, I have some kind of characteristic, or maybe I'm a good soccer player or, or tennis man, whatever, but I have a characteristic that might be transmitted to my children, then the, what I'm transmitting is not, the, not only the wealth itself, I'm transmitting the wealth because there is big wealth, but in addition, I'm, I'm transmit, uh, transmitting to some extent the genes that will allow my children to make a lot of money by themselves. And that should be a recipe for uh, more persistent inequality. Now, this is a standard story that you find a lot. If inequality reflects genetic differences as, as opposed to, to just luck, we should expect long-term inequality to, to be, uh, be more persistent. Uh, what we're pointing at, we do believe that there could be a mechanism like this, but we are looking at the opposite causality, which is that the genetic differences of the children may reflect past inequality. So it's not only that the genes have an impact of the future wealth, but it could be that the wealth today have an impact on the genes of your children. That's exactly what we want to look at. Now, from an economist's point of view, uh, the genetic transmission is essentially driven by uh, biology. There is not much we can do, at least for now. On the other hand, uh, wealth, there is a lot we as policymakers can do about wealth transmission. We can tax wealth, we can educate people. If, if we're talking about the human capital, we can try to increase the human capital of people who are not lucky enough to be born in the right family and so on and so forth. So in other words, uh, what this points to is uh, trying to look at to what extent the existing law and social system, taxation, education, and everything, uh, which have a direct impact on the transmission of the social status might have indirectly an impact on the genes and, uh, and therefore the, the, the inequality, the dynamic inequality. So this is the intuition. This, uh, let me come to the model. As, as, as I told you, it's a very simple model. I have an equal mass of men and women. Each woman is, is uh, characterized by two characteristics, X1, X2. Uh, let's call X1 genetically determined. Uh, let's call X2 socially determined, uh, and there is a joint distribution, and I will, ev everything here is the mean, so the mean of everything is zero throughout, throughout the paper. What, what matters is essentially the, is essentially the, the covariance matrix. So let's, this is the variance of, uh, of the um, genetic characteristic in the population, this is the variance of the wealth, let's say, in the population, and this is the covariance between those traits. Men, it's exactly the same. And for the moment, I'm, I'm assuming that they have exactly the same distribution. And at some point, for some illustration, I will assume that sigma equals zero, i.e. I will start from a population in which those two traits are absolutely not, characteristic, uh, not correlated in the first generation. And then I'm going to ask myself what happens in the following generations. Okay. Now, I will have a benchmark and uh, the, the interesting case, the benchmark will be random match. You know, the, you, you marry completely at random. You fall in love with someone that you, that you meet on the street and this is uncorrelated with anything of the, with any of those characteristics. Uh, this is the benchmark the, and it doesn't work in reality, by the way. I mean, we know that there is a lot of assortative matching on education, on income, on, on, on plenty of characteristics, including, by the way, including a, a physical attractiveness. There are some, a few data sets that allow us to look at this. Uh, the 
alternative that, uh, that we are interested in is uh, assortative matching on an index. So let me just, that just to simplify, here is the story. There is an attractiveness index, I of X, which depends on both X1 and X2. So this is the attractiveness index of the wife, which depends on her genetic correct endowment and on her uh, social endowment with the coefficient A. And essentially A measures the, the trade-off, the compensation between those two traits. Uh, the same, I have the same for the husband and I'm assuming that A is the same for men and women just to simplify. You can, you can uh, complexify this by maybe putting a different coefficient here. It's, uh, it's just complicates the computation. So again, under my assumption, these indices are distributed. Uh, so A reflects the trade-off between the two trades. Uh, just what does, when, when I'm assuming an index, what am I, uh, I am, uh, am I assuming here? This notion of compensation means that if I look at a woman who has a lot uh, of uh, was a, a lot of one trait, this might compensate the fact that she's less endowed in another trait. But in general, this trade-off will be perceived differently by a different potential spouse than me. It will be individual specific. The index uh, simplifies the analysis this because it essentially what I'm assuming is that every, every male agrees on the trade-off between female characteristic. And in the same way, every female agree about the trade-off of the male characteristic. And I'm assuming, as I said, A for men, for men and women. Let me inflict you a little bit of, of economic theory about matching, just to give you an idea of the context, uh, just as you see where the, all the computations will be, will be coming from. Um, so the, the story, uh, the main, the, the dominant model in the literature is uh, matching other transferable utility. So essentially it means what? It means, first of all, uh, when you marry, you create a surplus. When you marry, you can have a better life when married. Each of you can have a better life when married than the, the, the life that each of you could have as singles. That, that, that's why people marry makes sense. Makes sense. And the surplus in, the, in this kind of model will depend on the two indices. What do I call a matching? A matching is uh, a measure of the product space. So that's, that's a jargon to say, gamma. think of gamma of x, y as the probability that x marries y, simply. Uh, and I have two functions uh, because if there is a surplus, the surplus will be distributed among the, within the couple. And what I call uh, uh, the transferable utility essentially amounts to assuming that what she gets plus what he gets is the total surplus. The crucial thing is that those things are endogenous. So the equilibrium will tell you not only who marries whom, but also how is the surplus is distributed. Uh, incidentally, you can think of this as something like a bilateral auction model. Each male is bidding for, for female, and uh, the way you bid is you're willing to give up a larger fraction of the surplus. But it's bilateral in the sense that in standard auction, you bid for objects, but objects are not uh, bidding for buyers, whereas here, each side is, by, is bidding for the other side. This, the, the equilibrium notion that's standard in this uh, game theoretic literature, which is stability. So I would say that I reach an equilibrium, that, that, the, allocated, that the matching is stable. If A, I, I cannot find a married person who would rather be single because he or she would divorce, and B, I cannot find two individuals who are not married currently, but both would prefer being married together rather than their current situation, just because in that case, they would divorce and remarry. So that, and that's the technical translation. Now, there is a basic result which you can do without. It, it turns out that uh, it, it, uh, this class of problem belongs to a, a general class of mathematical problem, which are called optimal transportation. Uh, essentially, it's linear programming, which means that the kind of tools that you can use for, for empirical applications are very powerful. We have all those kind of very powerful algorithms for linear programming, but that's, that's not crucial for what I'm what I'm doing here. So anyway, the two things that I'm gonna, what are important here is, sorry. The first thing is this, what theory tells you under some assumption, which are natural, you will have positive assortative matching on, on indices. So essentially the people with a high index will marry a person with a high index. Uh, 
just to give you the intuition, why, why do I have this second cross derivative? Arguably, everybody prefers marrying someone who is more attractive. But remember, this is a bidding game. So the question is not, do I want to marry someone who is more attractive? That the answer is yes for everybody. The question is, my willingness to marry someone who is much more attractive, i.e. the amount that I'm willing to pay in terms of giving up a share of the surplus in order to get someone who is more attractive, does it increase or decrease with my own attractiveness? And if the answer is yes, then you got authority matching, which means that people with the high indices will marry together. So when you take this kind of model to, to data in practice, uh, you add some kind of noise. Uh, the, the seminal model have been developed by Aloysius like what, 15 years ago uh, with uh, Yuzhen Shu. Uh, so the, 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 the real econometrics of this, you have additional random, uh, random terms and so on and so forth. But since I want to concentrate on the theory, I will just assume that people marry based exactly on their index of attractiveness. Now, remember, you have plenty of people with the same index of attractiveness because there are two dimensions and the index is one dimensional. So you have a lot of people who look exactly as attractive to each other for different reasons. The question is, if I belong to an index and I know the index of my wife, which particular wife I am, am I going to, to end up with? And in this, this model doesn't answer by, by definition that the property of the index, so I'm just assume random matching at this point, which essentially means my, my decision will be uh, driven by something else, but this something else is orthogonal to the, to the frame. Very simple, but the upside is I can, I can work with this. So uh, one thing is you, you don't need to look at this, but uh, of course, in a model like this, there is a correlation between the characteristics of the couple, uh, in, of, of the husband and the wife, and you can compute them. This is a standard computation on the, on the normal distribution. Now, let me come to children. And here, this is where my genetic is, uh, is, is a Mickey Mouse genetic, but I want to make my life simple. Uh, the, the children, so there are two, uh, one boy and one girl, that's just because I want the population to be stable. Uh, the genetic characteristic of the child is just the average of the genetic characteristic of the husband and the wife divided by, so the mean uh, with a tau, which is less than one. So there is some kind of loss, uh, which could be a lot of things, which could be uh, the fact that there are some kind of uh, uh, exogenous shocks. It could be the fact that, uh, uh, people match on, on phenotype, not, not on genotype. So, I mean, whatever. Uh, think of X as, as, as a score, right? Uh, the score is positively correlated. The score of the kid is positively correlated to the score of the husband, positively cor correlated to the, the, uh, the score of the wife, but, but it's not exactly equal to the average, score, something like this. Uh, X2 is well, so this, this is much simpler. Uh, the wealth of the kid is the wealth of the the total wealth of the family, which is this sum here, uh, divided by two because there are two kids, uh, so it's shared. Uh, but there is this theta, and you can think of theta was one minus the taxation rate, something like this. Okay. In particular, I can change theta. Policy can change theta, which is what uh, I will be interested in. And then there are those shocks of Ceylon and Ita just because I want some innovation into the process. If you don't put some kind of exogenous shock, of course, when you look at the, the asymptotics, you will get some degenerate distribution. Um, intuitively, it's very normal. Uh, the last thing is I want, I, I didn't say anything about the units in which I'm measuring the X1 and X2. And uh, the, the way I'm, I'm do that, I'm, I'm choosing the unit by normalizing the variance of the epsilon and Ita to be one. Sorry. The marriage mark equilibrium that is the, the coefficients on the characteristics in the index is that independent exogenous to data. Which, 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 which? In the preferences that determine the matching. So the, who marries whom is determining the matching. Yes. And does that depend on the betas? On data and tau? It means it could. In, pra in practice, it won't because, it, because of my index assumption. In principle, it will. Thank you. So you, the, the nice thing is you can completely work out the equilibrium as a function of all the parameters. In this model, you will find that theta doesn't matter. Doesn't matter for who marries me. Yeah.
Now, if you, in the benchmark of random matching, you got exactly what you would expect, uh, the distribution of the kits, it's a normal distribution. The mean is zero, of course, because everything has been demeaned, but the covariance, the variance is whatever it is, it depends on the, on the variance of the shocks and not the coefficient, but the covariance is less than half the initial variance, which means that if you look at the long-term behavior of a, of a model like this, even if you start with a strong correlation between the characteristic among the parents, uh, this will dissipate, this will disappear. And that's exactly intuitive, right? That's exactly the, the logic of random matching. Uh, that's not the case, of course, if there is positive assortative matching. Uh, in the case of positive matching, in a sense, we have the opposite result. Even if you start with couples in which with individuals in which the two characteristics are completely uncorrelated, even at the first generation, you, you see a correlation between the characteristics, which is exactly you know, the story that I was telling you. Among the wealthy people, some of them have a very beautiful wife, and therefore the kids will be more beautiful than, uh, than average, even, even if the, yeah, we can think of real life example in which a wealthy person marries a beautiful wife, right? I mean, uh, I know that it sounds a little bit cliche, but, uh, but it's in the data. It's, uh, I'm, not, I'm not giving any name, right? Okay, just some, some graph. Now you can solve everything. Uh, actually, you, you have a closed form. Uh, so this is just, let me take a, a population in which the, let's, let's say the, the initial variants uh, are the, just the variants of the shock, right? Uh, and then the initial correlation is zero and the coefficient of genetic transmission is 0.95. Now this gives you the correlation between the, the, between the two characteristics of each child as a function of theta, which is the taxation and A, which is the, the impact. And what you see that everything is increasing in, in theta. So in other words, if you decrease the taxation rate, uh, not only you, uh, you exacerbate this mechanism by which there is a correlation between the two characteristics of the children. So the correlation between the characteristic will appear in, in a minute, I will talk about the asymptotic of this. Uh, this correlation, not only there will be a correlation asymptotically between the characteristic, but this correlation is directly influenced by something which is determined by, by the political system, IA, uh, this theta, which is again, taxation or education or whatever. Sorry, can we, can you just, I just want to understand. So A is here. So A, remember that A is the respective weights of those characteristic. So if matching is based only on one characteristic, which is here or, then, or there, you don't get this correlation. Sure. It, it means, simply means that the second characteristic is irrelevant. So you will never get a correlation. And the correlation is maximum somewhere in the middle. Now, the location of this point depends on everything. And all the parameters depends on theta. I mean, it's, it's, it's a kind of complicated uh, surface. So what if we factor it? Like, I'm just trying to... So this, so this is the correlation between the child characteristics. That's the, the correlation between the, the genetic characteristic of the child and the genetic characteristic of the parent. Oh, sorry, of the... Sorry between the genetic characteristic of the child and the social characteristic of the child, starting from parents for which there was zero correlation. Correlation of the, uh, uh, the second thing is, if, if we think in terms of, of inequality and transmission of the inequality, this is the correlation uh, between the wealth of the, uh, of the kid and the wealth of the parents. So remember X prime two, is the wealth of the kid, and x2 plus y2 is the total wealth of the parents. Under random matching, it's exactly the variance uh, up to the this theta parameter. Uh, when you have assortative matching, you got the formula which is a bit more complex, uh, and it gives you something like, like, like this. Again, I have uh, a and theta. Uh, so the, the green one is what you would get under random matching, and, uh, and the red one is what you get with this kind of a social assortative matching. Uh, so what you see is that, uh, A, the fact that there is assortative matching increases the correlation between the parents' wealth and the children's wealth. 
And this is a world in which, remember, my genes have no impact on my income. Any impact, direct impact of my genes uh, over my, uh, the income of my income, so the income of the children will simply accentuate, exacerbate this kind of mechanism. And this is all, this is always increasing in theta. So the less you tax, uh, the more you increase not only the wealth, but also the correlation between parents and Genetic as endogenous now, another computation that you can do, the, the cool thing with those kind of normal distribution is that you can compute close from basically everything. The, the one thing uh, we look at here is what the expected endowments of a genetic endowment of the kid conditional on the wealth of the parents. So uh, first of all, it only depends on the total wealth. And B, under random matching, it's exactly this, which means that if sigma equals zero, if the if the characteristics are not correlated, uh, there will be uh, exactly the expected value of your genetic endowments. Conditional of the wealth will simply not depend on the wealth of your parents. Uh, under assortative matching, even if sigma equals zero, you got something which is strongly positive. And again, you can see how it varies with a bunch of things. Uh, I don't have much time, so. Uh, let me look at the asymptotic. So you take this kind of model and you look what happens when time goes to infinity. And there is an asymptotic distribution here. Under random matching is very simple, zero correlation. And, uh, and the variance depends on those, on those coefficients in a very simple way. Uh, whereas under, assortative, uh, under uh, positive assortative matching, we got, uh, we, we do have, sorry, a correlation, and now this gives you the correlation. Very interesting here is the convexity. Yeah. This tells you is that even with a little bit of compensation, you can get the correlation between genes uh, and uh, uh, and the social characteristic in the asymptotic population. Uh, wealth correlation, you can do the same with wealth correlation. Uh, let me just conclude about this. Um, first of all, the correlation between characteristic, the conditional expectation of genetic we, we, uh, given wealth, the conditional expectation of wealth given genetics, uh, and the correlation between parents and children wealth, all this, which are strong components of inequality, are increasing in, in theta, uh, i.e. decreasing in the tax rate. Uh, in particular, higher taxation reduces the variance of wealth. That's not very surprising, but it also reduces the correlation between genetic and wealth. So for in particular, what you would expect is that the, the, the correlation between wealth and genetics should be smaller in Sweden than in the US. Or in, in, so if you look at how beautiful, how more beautiful than average the wealthy people uh, are, uh, the answer should be much more in the US than in uh, wealth. No, the one thing that I'm interested in here, here is that current inequality may be positively related to low intergenerational mobility. That is, that is a puzzle that, that's uh, the four economists. Uh, those are two completely different concepts. Uh, uh, current inequality, you just measure the inequality of distribution of income within the population now. Uh, mobility is what's the relationship between the income of the parents and the income of the children. I tend to view, and many people tend to view, that the real concerning serious inequality is the second one. The it's not so much the fact that there are wealthy people and there are poor people. You don't want people to be too poor, but that's a different concern. But in terms of inequality, the real shocking inequality is the fact that people have different chances, different opportunities, in the sense that they have not born in the right family, the probability that they will move up is very small. Now, if you look at, this is borrowed from paper by David Alter. Uh, I love this graph on, on the horizontal axis, you've got inequality, and the further you go to the right, the more current inequality you have. On the vertical axis, you've got the way we measure uh, uh, intertemporal um, uh, to, to, to 
uh, intertemporal correlation. Essentially, uh, the measure tells you how much do I know about the children's uh, wealth if I know the parents' wealth. So if you go, the higher you go, the less mobility you have in this particular society. And what's fair, and you know, there is this kind of American dream myth that there is a lot of inequality in America today, but that the price to pay for a very mobile society in which even people at the bottom can make it to the top, that's completely false. You look at those data, it's also there. And last but not least, uh, we tend to take uh, genetic endowment as exogenous, uh, but you know, in this kind of situation, genetic endowment might not be uh, might not be uh, exogenous, and that should be something that might influence, in a vague way, the way we formulate our empirical strategy. Thank you. All right. Hi, I'm Alvarez. Uh, like Pierre Andre, uh, I I don't know any uh, genetics for sure. <laughs> So I'm not sure why we have two uh, matching people discussing this paper, but in any case, uh, you're forewarned. Uh, since Pierre-André didn't want to put up a picture, I thought I would put up a picture <laughs> to see whether rich people get more attractive spouses. I wonder that is if, uh, worse than this. <laughs> the question is whether Jeff is attractive. Anyway. Um, so this is a paper. It Whoops. Sorry. It's a very nice introduction into uh, the marriage matching literature and added to that uh, intergeneral transmission uh, literature including genetic characteristics. I haven't seen anything like this. So this is uh, very nice. Okay. So directly, uh, they study okay, social genetics uh, authoritative matching, uh, then try to see how the matching is going to affect the matrix of economic and Okay. Uh, a part that they didn't, uh, they under didn't discuss, but in the paper, they show that a higher birth order of an individual, which is basically an exogenous characteristic, basically, uh, is negatively correlated with a polygenic score for educational attainment. So if you are born second, uh, just going to marry a spouse that is not going to be as, uh, as educated. Okay, so uh, uh, anyway, that's what that's what that's about. Now uh, I'm gonna since this is uh, a lot of people here might not understand uh, the marriage matching literature. I'm gonna go over a little bit what Pierre Andre uh, knows. Uh, the whole point of marriage matching, at least from an economist or an empirical point of view, is really given a uh, population supply of men and women by different characteristics. What we really want to do is uh, try to figure out who's going to be married to whom and who remains unmarried. So the role of the model is to predict what new marriage matching equilibrium will look like if we could change the population supply. So beyond a uh, focus on tax rates, and you could focus on something else, like maybe seeing the supply. Okay. Uh, so the question really is uh, how to predict uh, what's going to happen in the new marriage distribution if something is obviously changed. And we have a class of models that P. Andre is going to uh, be using, which is a transformation class, which simply says that different matches, right, different types of um, spouses, okay. They're going to generate uh, different amounts of marital output, which can be divided. Up. So, for example, if a man generates 10 units of marital output for a wife, so the wife, a uh, woman looks at this man and says, Well, he's generating 10 units of marital output, and a woman generates 11 units of marital output for her husband, the total output for that uh, couple is going to be 21, and they can divide between the two of them. Okay. Uh, so then the model predicts that the marriage matching pattern which results will be the one that will be chosen by a social planner who says, I'm going to pay all these men and women up to generate the largest amount of marital output that we can have in the society. Okay. Now, 
the equilibrium is also uh, same. The, the equilibrium outcome will be the same if marriage market participants can transfer marital output between the potential participants. Okay, which is what uh, Pierre Andre emphasized. Now, I guess I want to think of this as really a way to generate empirical distributions of marital outcomes. Okay, so whether you buy into the specific economics that we talk about, uh, there's a lot of assumptions buried in that, but if you didn't really care as much about that and you just want empirical models, right, magic, you can do that. Now, what do you need to estimate this kind of model? Uh, so the main thing uh, you need is basically male preferences for wife J. So here I'm just gonna put genetics and uh, earnings. Uh, to make it easier to, to for us, right? So this is what Pierre Andre uh, assumes, okay? And then the women uh, choose those husbands, and this is the husband's genes, and that's the, the earning. Now, this is one thing that's uh, important about this model, okay, is that all the men rank women same way. Just depends on family characteristics and it doesn't depend on genes. Okay? And it's the other way around for the women, they all rank husbands the same way and it doesn't depend on who she is. Okay? Put it another way, everybody uh, ranks uh, participants of the opposite sex in exactly the same way. Okay? And then they put in how basically uh, Transmission of genes and transmission of earnings. Okay, um, so let me just say that. <laughs> so the nice thing is, really, this is almost a complete specification of the model, and then population suffice. Okay, which is what uh, Piandre talked about. Uh, he uses the benchmark case of random matching, and then he has the metric uh, spousal preferences. He already has gone through the results and they're all very nice and intuitive. So that's really good. Uh, he has two other extensions, which I also found uh, really interesting. Okay. Let me give you a particular one that I think is kind of interesting to think about. Okay. Let's assume a model in which men only value husband's dream. Okay. Uh, uh, the genetics of equals one. In other words, uh, even though uh, she might bring earnings, uh, the men doesn't. They just, that's not how they rank, okay? Uh, this shows up, by the way, the online dating data. Uh, for some reason, uh, the guy just looked at what they think is the most beautiful woman and they click on them, okay? Uh, and we also look at the other case where women only met uh, values husband's okay? Uh, yeah, women only value husband's earnings. Now, I think it's kind of interesting. The reason why it's kind of interesting is uh, so there is still unique ranking of men for wives and women for husbands, uh, but they, they care about different traits. Okay? So I'm interested is that it also shows basically okay, there is going to be a strong correlation between beauty and earnings. In other words, the richest man is going to get the best looking wife. Okay? And you think that's a reasonable description of the picture that I showed you, uh, that's the model that's going to generate that. Okay. Uh, now, the interesting thing about here, though, you can ask is, well, what happens if women labor force participation rate decreases? In other words, what happens when we move towards a society where now we begin to value women's contribution to earnings? Okay. So the interesting thing I can think here is kind of interesting. What happens to family wealth inequality? We talk about family inequality, wealth inequality. Does a traditional society get more inequality than this modern society that we are talking about? Mm -hmm. okay. So they have this case. Uh, they don't emphasize it. But I think it's an interesting, interesting case to, uh, to, to think about. Uh, there's another, another case they study, which I also like, uh, which is that your earnings depend on of the kids depends on the earnings of the parents, which is fine, which is what they did. But it also could depends on uh, the genetic component uh, 
of, of the kid, which is really the genetic components of the parents. Okay? In other words, parents' genes and earnings affects kids' earnings. Okay? It's an interesting problem because then we really want to think about basically um, if you're wealthy, you make your kids more wealthy, but if you have better genes as the parent, you also make your kid uh, have higher earnings, which I think is, uh, is an interesting case uh, to, to think about. Uh, they both have, both those cases they have, but I, I emphasize what was what we have. Okay, so I, I ran out. Why don't we uh, open up for uh, questions, comments? Ten minutes for that, and then uh, we'll see if there's more. Anyone here to start? Yeah, so maybe you can help me out. Um, it seems to me one reason uh, people like wealthy spouses is that their kids will be wealthy. And that matters both because they care about the consumption of their kids and because it improves their kids' marriage aspects. But that suggests that the um, preferences over spousal wealth depend on like a state taxation. So like the A and the index should be pretty much as to the, the tax. So essentially, um, this here we're using a simple model in which the um, uh, in which the index is linear. You can do exactly the same with an index, which is not linear. The linearity is that as you do the comparative statics and change the tax rate, the wait, wait. Change. the index is linear. It means that the, here the marginal value of, of increasing a little bit beauty is exactly A, and this is a constant. If you put the product, for instance, for the index, uh, then the marginal value of increasing the beauty is an increasing function of your own wealth, and that will go in this direction. I mean, there are, in particular, the, the reason, to be honest, the reason why we're using a linear index here is that we have normal distribution. The sum of normal distribution is normal. The product of marginal distribution is not normal. So if you want to introduce nonlinear activity indices, the computation becomes much, much more complex. In particular, you don't have cost distribution. But there is something else, which is even in, in this model, I'm much more willing to pay either for the for the, for the beauty or for the, the income of my wife, if my, I'm myself wealthy. It's, it's the trade-off that depends on that does not depend on my wealth. But 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 my willingness to pay increases in both. Remember what I pay is endogenous. It's an, it's it's not an of the equilibrium. Okay. I, I was saying that the, the tax rate is what you what is these things. The coefficient A is just the trade-off between the two. Yeah, and how much you are going to pay for both of them, this is endogenous. So I, I guess I'm a little bit interested in, in the kind of like marginal gain from, like you said, like a, like beauty increasing a little bit and how that would influence then. How, and then I know your model's not like equipped to do this, but I just kind of started to think that it would be kind of, Maybe plausible to think about the costs of changing one of those traits. Oh, correct. Sorry. One of the, of the costs of changing one of those traits. So, ah. and in the case of like earnings, you can imagine what that might be. In the case of beauty, you can imagine what that might be. And then how the kind of prices of doing that would then shift the kind of, the kind of distribution, like the correlation between these two things. So, I'm just kind of so, curious if that's even like. So there is actually the actual matching literature goes in this direction in the following sense. What I, there, there is this function f that I call the surplus and I did not specify it. Uh, the, most of the literature uses an explicit model of which also behavior to specify the, 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 the f function. And in particular, uh, what, what you are, so think of uh, x, x as human capital. It's not your income, it's your ability to generate income. Right. But your actual income will be your ability and the decision, the labor supply decision, and the labor supply decision will be endogenous, and this will be part of this F mechanism. So you know what I presented was oversimplified, but but you can do that. You can you can. Yeah, imagine the specific. So did you which, which the, 
shifting the costs to you. Then you could, you could do that. It's like this. And, and by, by the way, this is the, the um, Aloysius comment was, was well taken. I mean, uh, uh, there are two things in his comment. One is labor supply of women is endogenous in this kind of model. Uh, so if you work it up, you realize that if you change the, the, the distributions, you will change the labor supply decision. Uh, what Aloysius was asking is, is, a, is a more complex question, which is what if the beta changes? But the, well, you know, if I, uh, uh, one of my former students wrote uh, our dissertation uh, uh, on, on this kind of issue. Uh, and, and so the bottom line was, so essentially what she was looking at is a trade off for women between two characteristics. One is uh, human capital the ability to generate income, and the other one was fertility. Uh, why? Because she was interested in the decision to stop after a college or continue for, for graduate education. And the main cause, one of the main causes of continuing is uh, it decreased your, 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 most people who do go for graduate study, uh, they, 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 they don't marry immediately, or at least they don't have kids immediately, uh, which means that their fertility tend to decline. They tend to have less kids and so on and so forth. So she looks at exactly this trade-off. And what she said, well, so what, what, what she argues is uh, back in the 60s, uh, this cost was huge because the value of human capital was not large, especially for women. On the other hand, the, the typical family size was four or five uh, kids. Uh, you, you see that a lot in the, in the pew kind of... Uh, uh, polls and so on, uh, meaning that there was a very high cost in terms of fertility and, uh, and the benefits in terms of education were small. As a result, the, the matching equilibrium one was such that the best husband, the wealthiest husband, were not marrying the most educated wives. They were marrying the wives in the middle. And this has changed because the coefficients of the model have changed. And now uh, we have a complete, so, or, or, you know, that the beauty of this kind of model, you can see how the equilibrium changes with the parameters. So I, I guess this is more of a, of a comment than a, uh, than a question, but I think it, it, and it, but it raises questions that I can't answer on the fly. <laughs> if there's people that, that can, that would be, that'd be great. But I think that the, the, the idea of the genetic endowment of, a of one's child being potentially endogenous the shocks that you're receiving and then the subsequent choices in the marriage market is an interesting one. And it's not just the genetic endowment of the child, right? Thinking of that as, oh, genes are endogenous, that's kind of a, a potential takeaway, but maybe more importantly, especially in light of within family variation being so important, is that within family variation, the extent of it, the size of it is something that's endogenous, right? And so I think that, you know, that, that there's a real interesting implication there too, that we, we, we think of within family uh, variation as being a kind of gold standard, that's like maybe one of our best ways of identifying these, uh, these effects of endowments. I mean, that requires there to be differences within the households, right? You're kind of, now this is where my kind of entrance fly is not great, but relative to a kind of a cross variation, you're, you're leaning much more heavily on those households that actually have a greater degree of variation. I mean, of course you are, right? So I mean, if, if, that, if that's occurring endogenously because of shocks that that may be unobservable and that might be interacting with the genetic elements in other ways, that creates, I think, really interesting interpretational issues for these within family estimates. And it, it's not entirely clear to me whether that biases them up or down or relative or not. But I think that the issues raised have a real empirical, you know, yeah. you know implications for that. That was exactly our intention. This is very preliminary, obviously. Uh, the, there are two things that we wanted to do. One is uh, to try to see to what extent the matching literature, which exists and have been developed, could be sort of uh, married, matched with genetics. And the second thing is this notion that genetics can be can be endogenous, you know, in this very specific sense. But and I'm sure this has an impact, for instance, for the kind of question that that were discussed about John's paper, like you know, when when you forget about the the the, the score of the parents. The, what, what kind of endogeneity problem do we have here? It, this kind of issue might be relevant for that. And I, I, I'm certainly not claiming that I understand where, where it takes us, but actually it's a way of thinking about it. Well, you do have two answers though, and they're stated here. So Aloysius didn't quite provide the answer. I'm just curious about these two questions that you said you would answer in the paper. Which one you talking about? Well, no, it's, it's the bullet here, the, the top bullet, and then there's a bullet within the bullet. 
It's if married women's participation rate increases, what does it imply? That's the first question. And the second one is the relative magnitude of theta and lambda. So since you've answered both questions, I'd be curious. So there, yeah, okay. well, there is some, still some work to do regarding the first, the second bullet point. Uh, it's, it's really, you know, what happens when you change the, um, the, the coefficient for the women without changing the coefficient for men, uh, which is not what I presented here because we are assuming that they are the same. Uh, the problem is you don't have cross-form solutions, so you, you, need to, to, you need to do numeric simulation. So we have not done that, but that's, that's on the agenda. Now, how large is uh, theta relative, relative to lambda? Uh, I'm, not, I'm not qualified to answer that. You know, what, what, what does lambda mean? It's the impact of your, of your genes on your income. It's you guys who know that. I don't, I mean, that, that you know. So you just take in a polygenic score for lambda? Is that it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, well, the, the kind of regression, you know, you put, uh, you put your, your income on the left hand side and you put the, the, the slope yeah, on the right hand side, that would give you a lambda. Maybe. And, and this one, one last question. Uh, yeah. Intergenerational mobility is not. Um, so after the three or four generations, so the parents' income difference does not transmatch, translate much into the you know the offspring uh, income difference. I, I realizing that so, you know it depends on your model time the theta and lambda here, but I'm curious because of this uh, like kind of also this dimension. If you simulate the real model, if you match your model using parents and child, and then let your model run for multiple generations, like let's say three or four generations, uh, just curious to see what is the predicted intergenerational mobility. So. We have this you know, the lambda, which is the what I what I showed at the end, it's the asymptotic distribution. So that's you know, you let you let the model run for infinity and you can uh, compute the asymptotic distribution cross form. With the lambda, things are more much more complex and you need to do some. On the you know, the lambda is the standard explanation of, of this kind of long term inequality. Something like you know, those people, if my if my wealth only comes from the luck, it's gonna disappear within three, four generations. If it comes because I'm smarter and my my smartness, my, my smart genes wouldn't be transmitted to my children, you expect much more long-term inequality. Uh, our point is even if we don't have the lambda, you still have a mechanism like this. But how would you relate that to something like a Becker-Toms model? Becker-Toms would give you a genetic correlation. They assume it's AR1. And so it's an autoregressive model in that, and then they stick it into a first order autoregressive in income over generations, then they get the second order regression, and then you're able to essentially then compute what the contribution is of this so-called genetic component to the variance of income. And they would show, yeah, the, there's greater heritability, uh, would mean greater IgE in the sense of UU, and more inequality in the cross-section. Yeah. So how do you differ from those conclusions, I guess? What do you add to that, I guess, is what I'm I mean. Essentially the fact that, that genetic is endogenous. That, that's what we were. Well, well, but here it is endogenous in the sense the parents are transmitting it. I mean, it, it, the the amount could be modified, I guess you're saying. But I mean, you could put in parameters like tax burn. It, they do like yeah. people like Solon and others put in things like a tax rate on income and progressive, you know, uh, social transfers. And again, talk about how that modifies the IGE. I'm just wondering how this would change that literature. Yeah. They don't have this kind of comparison between assortative matching and random matching. No, they don't. But I'm saying the similar results you're going to get. They call it genetics in the sense of AR. The genetic component they they build in through this mechanical correlation, right? I just wonder, it would be nice to kind of piggyback your model onto theirs, yeah. right? And see how that would affect that AR1 proposition. That just okay. kind of to plug it into the standard. Oh, well, what some people consider the standard. What you're saying is if I want to take that to data, I, I have to be much more explicit about the random. So it would just be interesting how you would modify that autoregressive component. And how can you identify it? Which is, but I thought there was some work, right? We heard from a couple of weeks ago that somehow the, the, the correlation of these polygenic scores, the average polygenic score over the families was, was not AR1. Maybe I misunderstood. From short? Short, yes, short. Didn't you have some results from that? 
I thought you were talking about the transmissibility. I mean, the polygenic score over generation. Maybe it's something. Right, right. Oh, yes, but that, that would then um, depend on. The, I think that, 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 that would assume uh, random matching, which is precisely. Well, right, no, I'm saying, but you, well, well, us, I know but you were finding some results there, right, about the, about the nature. You were, I thought you were disputing that it was even AR1. Maybe I'm wrong. No, I don't think I showed anything like that. <laughs> okay, I misunderstood you. Right. 